Hello, everyone. Welcome to our shared devotionals on the seven last words of Jesus Christ. Our first reading comes from the Gospel of Luke. In Luke 23, 33 to 38, it reads, And when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Jesus' first words on the cross reflect the purpose for his ultimate sacrifice. It is a heartfelt prayer of intercession supported by his unselfish act on the cross. It addresses our greatest need, forgiveness. You see, many today make the mistake of thinking that much of what is happening is the result of man's reckless treatment of nature, pollution, overpopulation, and the depletion and misuse of natural resources. But the truth is, it's, it's actually deeper than that. I believe this virus is a result of our mistreatment, not of nature, but its creator. The fact that this is a worldwide pandemic is evidence of this. As many of us have seen, no one is exempt. Young or old, rich or poor, good or bad, no matter what ethnic background, every one of us are affected by this virus. So what is really happening? Well, the truth is, we cannot expect to keep ignoring, even rejecting the God who created and sustains the earth and think that everything will simply continue under our own conditions. Now, mind you, this is not God willing this to happen. It is God's immutable law in action. The Bible says what you sow, you will reap. You see, absent of God and his guidance in our lives, Jesus was right in saying, we don't know what we're doing. Isaiah 53, 6 confirms, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. You see, Jesus gave his life on the cross so that he could offer forgiveness to all of us who respond to him in humility. The cross, my friend, is about forgiveness. Forgiveness for you and me. The restoration of our broken relationship with God through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. Now, how can we receive this forgiveness. First John 1 John 1.9 tells us, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's right. We just confess. We tell Him. We admit to Him our need. And receiving His complete forgiveness opens the door of grace that will bring healing in our lives. Now, we don't know when this virus will end or when this crisis will be over, but we, can't, we don't need to wait for this crisis to be over. We can actually have faith over fear when we receive the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. I pray that you will do so today. Thank you, and God bless you. Right after the declaration of forgiveness, which is the first word of our Lord, Someone may ask, how can God forgive someone who do not know what they're doing? Well, the answer is found on the second word. Remember the thief on the cross when he begged Jesus and he humbled himself before our Lord? He said, Lord, remember me when you come to your kingdom. And Jesus answered, and he said, Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. In other words, there are three responses that the Lord Jesus uh, addressed to his word. Number one is the positive response. Jesus said, Truly I tell you, or I assure you, that's an assurance. Of, of, 
of the forgiveness. And second one is the urgent response today, not tomorrow, not I'll think it over today. I assure you today. And the third response is glorious. Today you will be with me. It means you, we will all be with the Lord. We don't need to die to be with him. We can start tonight. He said, I assure you, today you will be with me. The best part of that promise is that we will all be in paradise. So if we have Christ in our life, that's an assurance that we will all go to heaven. But let me ask you this question. God forbid, if your life ends tonight, are you sure you're going to heaven? If that question still question behind your mind, well, we have the answer. We just need to humble ourselves in sincere prayer of repentance. You may follow. I'd like to invite you all to pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I humble myself before you to ask you to forgive all my sins. Thank you, Lord, for dying on that cross of Calvary. And thank you, Lord, that my sins will be forgiven. Thank you, Lord, that you can be the Lord of my life. So, Lord, I'd like to surrender everything to you. Take over my life. Be my Lord, Lord God. And thank you for being my Savior. God, I want to be a participant in building up your kingdom. So, Lord, tonight, take control over my life. Thank you for your love, your grace, and your mercy. Thank you for the peace that transcends all understanding. Thank you, God, for being with me. In Jesus' name, amen. Hi, good evening. My name is Jeff. I'm from Team Los Angeles. Welcome to the seven last words for all Filipino Church of the Nazarene. And uh, I'll be sharing to you the third word. That would be woman, behold thy son, behold thy mother. Speaking of mothers, we all love our mothers. We all love our nanas. And uh, shout out to my mother. Happy birthday to you. I love you. Thank you for uh, our, all your love for me. And um, I remember a little girl asked her mother, how did the human race appear, mommy? The mother answered, oh, God made Adam and Eve and they had children and so was all mankind made. Two days later, the girl asked her father the same question. The father answered, many years ago, there were monkeys from which the human race evolved. The confused girl returned to her mother and said, Mom, how is it possible that you told me the human race was created by God? And Dad said they developed from monkeys. The mother answered, Well, dear, it is very simple. I told you about my side of the family, and your father told you about his. <laughs> I like you, a lot of people picture Mary as being appointed as mother, right? Not only of the beloved disciple na si John, but sa uh, mother as lahat ng disciples, pati sa mother sa buong church. Kasi siguro probably because of her relationship with Jesus, no? yung iconic birth nativity scene. That's why she was perceived as the mother of all. However, the text explains its meaning rather clearly. In John 19.27, it says there, from that time on, this disciple, na si John, the beloved, took her into his home. So, ang nag-alaga, hindi si Mary, kundi si John. Si John the Beloved na kaibigan ni Jesus. So, the point of this verse is not that Mary is being appointed mother of the church. Rather, Jesus is clearly appointing John as responsible in his stead to care for his mother in her widowhood. I'm sorry, widowhood. Kapampangan ako eh. Widowhood. Widowhood. What this word from the cross teach us? Ano nga ba? Ang matututunan natin. Alam niyo, as I reflect on this third word from the cross, I, I begin to see something about the extent of Jesus' love. 
na ibang perspective naman. Here he is dying in agony, gasping for each breath. No? Probably he sees his mother, the one who comforted him through all of childhood's cuts and bruises, teases and taunts. No, ito yung nanay niya na palagi nasa tabi niya, na mahal na mahal siya, kagaya na experience natin sa mga nanay natin. When he was a boy, probably he would run to um, mother to Mama Mary and instead be wrapped in her uh, protective, comforting mother love, just like we also experience with our mothers. But now it's kind of different. He sees her at the foot of the cross, heartbroken, no? weeping, inconsolable. His heart goes out to her. Rather than being consumed by an understandable concern for his own welfare, kasi isipin niya sarili niya during that time, no, he is touched by hers. Naisip niya yung nanay niya, mangyayari sa nanay ko. Nanay ko to eh. Mahal ko to. Soon to be a widow, imagine niya social pressure, who will be known as mother to that crucified criminal. Life for sure will not be easy for Mary pagka wala na si Jesus sa tabi niya. It will be hard for her. What are we to learn from the third word? For me, we must love our parents. If there's one thing I want to share to you tonight, uh, if there's one thing I want to share to you guys sa gabi na to, no matter what, love your parents. Sometimes our parents misunderstand us or disapprove of decisions we make. Yeah, Tao sila eh. Kakamali minsan. Sometimes, they can hurt us grievously. I remember my papa's anger. No, he has his anger problem and he used to vent it out to me through physical, verbal, and emotional abuse. But I must love my father. It is a command of God. Jesus too, no, actually had felt the hurt of misunderstanding from his family. Even, yeah, even his mother. It's apparent that during part of his ministry, at least, his family didn't understand him. And tatandaan niyo ba yung uh, wedding at Cana? No? Ito yung time na Mary pushed Jesus to change the water into wine. Even though sabi niya sa kanya, my time has not yet come. Remember sa John 7.5, sabi niya, sabi doon, even his own brothers, hindi naniwala sa kanya, did not believe in him. But whether they understand or even approve of us, whether we can even trust them at this point in our lives, still, we are told, sabi mo sa katabi mo, honor your father and your mother. It's a commandment, Exodus 20.12. And we must obey. Christ-powered love can help heal the hurts from our families, that's for sure. Kaya nga, I remind you again for tonight, we must love our parents. Here at the end of his life, we see Jesus, the tender love of a son for his mother. A mother probably who had sometimes misunderstood him. Ang gusto ko sa scenario na to, he was uh, endorsing yung mami niya kay John. Yung kanyang earthly obligations. As he dies, he settles his earthly obligations as best as he can. We hear him say, Dear woman, here's your son. And John, here's your mother. It's an endorsement. Bago siya umalis, he made sure na merong mag-aalaga sa nanay niya. So again, may I remind you guys, love your parents. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we, we, we see Jesus' example of love and responsibility. As wonderful and loving as family relationships can be, they are often complex and sometimes hurtful. We ask you to help us sort them out. Show us to love you. At the same time, we love our family members, especially our parents. Give us a divine wisdom that we need so that we can love as Jesus loves. In His name we pray. 
Amen and amen. Thank you very much. God bless you. Have a great evening. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The fourth word of Jesus on the cross reminds me of other times when the Son of Man cried. He sighed over Jerusalem's hard-heartedness and unbelief in him, Matthew 23. He wept at the death of his friend Lazarus, John 11. Then on the cross he cried two times. Why Jesus cried, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me, was not explained by the Gospel writer Matthew. But being forsaken by his father, there was no doubt about it. Why would the Son of the Almighty God, the one who was tempted in every way as we are but never sinned, now hang on the cross only intended to execute the worst criminals in those days? However, the scripture was clear why the Son of God hung on the cross forsaken by his heavenly Father. First, Jesus became sin for us that we may be made without sin. Second, Jesus was condemned on our behalf that we may be freed from our guilt. Consequently, Jesus was punished for our sins that we may be saved from our own punishment. Jesus died on the cross that we may be made alive forevermore. Long before our Savior suffered on the cross, the prophet Isaiah declared, Surely he has borne our grief and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Isaiah 53 Today, Jesus Christ is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. A song by Gordon Jensen reflects the reasons why the Son of Man was forsaken by his heavenly Father. It says, I was guilty with nothing to say, and they were coming to take me away. But then a voice from heaven was heard that said, Let him go, take me instead the crown of thorns and the spear in his side, and all the pain should have been mine. Those rusty nails were meant for me, yet Jesus took me and let me go free. I should have been crucified. I should have suffered and died. I should have hung on the cross in disgrace, but Jesus, God's Son, took my place. When the Son of Man took the place of punishment for our sins, and the Holy God released his wrath against our sins, which Jesus carried. God forsook sin against the human form of his only Son. Thus Jesus on the cross can't help but cried, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Hi, I'm Pastor June. I would like to share with you my reflections on the fifth saying of Jesus, I am thirsty. In John chapter 19, verse 28, it says, Later knowing that everyone had now been finished, and so that scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. These words of Jesus, I am thirsty, remind us of the profound power and wisdom of God as demonstrated in this seemingly lame and foolish act of Jesus Christ on the cross. To the Jews, the crucified Christ is a stumbling block. It is not a sign of power, but it is a sign of weakness. And to the Greeks, for God to suffer in the hands of mortal men and women is not wise at all, but utter foolishness. However, for us who believe and agree in the power and wisdom of God in Jesus Christ, Jesus is the way the truth and the life and with this i would like to share with you my three reflections first by saying i am thirsty jesus reveals the truth in his person being the son of god in blood and in flesh jesus is able to empathize in our human weaknesses and our failings and also sympathize in our desperate desire to be delivered from the power of sin and death Second, by saying, I am thirsty, Jesus confirms the truth. God's word 
is literally being fulfilled even in the pain and the suffering of our Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. In Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 53 verse 5 it says, But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities, and the punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. Lastly, by saying, I am thirsty, Jesus offers life to those who thirst for him. Jesus did not say, I am thirsty, to extend his life here on earth. In fact, when he said that, he was literally submitting himself to the power and the will of his Father, even to die on the cross. Man is always thirsting for things that last, which only God can offer. St. Augustine says, our hearts is restless until it rests in you. In the same vein, the writer of Psalms in 42 verse 1, as the deer pants for the water, so my soul pants for you. In God's power and wisdom, he shows to us how Jesus thirsts for our humility. So we will surrender our all to him as the way, as the truth, and as the life. So that we will love our God with everything that we have and love our neighbors as ourselves. Thank you for joining us in this time of celebration and reflection as we look back on the seven last words of the Lord Jesus Christ that uh, he said as a fulfillment of his mission and also a fulfillment of uh, his plan for the world. It is so meaningful that we are doing this in this way so that uh, we can reach to you and reach out many people at this uh, at least very unusual time. Brothers and sisters, the sixth word, it is finished. Let me give you the full context, the whole verse or passage of this particular word so that we can at least better understand what it meant and what the Lord would like us to understand. The passage is found in John chapter 19, says, A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put a sponge on a stalk of a hyssop plant, and lifted up to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, he said, It is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. And let me offer this reflection so that at least uh, we will see uh, as God has been leading us, uh, we will see what God would like us to understand. Probably the Lord has a different insight or a special insight to you at this time. By the way, the provision of vinegar was believed to be both a sign of mockery and it's also a way of inducing further pain. Uh, as Jesus was at the point of his death, ready and willing to give up his spirit, his all, he was given that particular wine vinegar drink. It was not meant to relieve his pain. It was not meant to give to quench his thirst, but it was meant to increase more pain. It is a way of prolonging the consciousness of crucifixion, the consciousness of shame and pain. It's the ultimate mockery of the Savior, which was intended to suffer more. It's, uh, what's the me what is the meaning of this uh, act that the Roman soldier did to Jesus? Uh, biblically, it was a fulfillment of what has been prophesied long long time ago in uh, Psalms chapter 69 it said they gave me also gold for my meat 
and my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. This is what was prophesied in the book of Psalms. And now at this moment, at that point in time, when he was offered that wine vinegar, it was a fulfillment. In the same extent, in the same manner, I would like to encourage you that this particular act, this word, it is finished, means that God came true. He fulfilled the prophecy. He did what was said long time ago. So if what was said long time ago happened and was fulfilled by Jesus himself, it is also logical to think that his promises will also be fulfilled. The word it is finished means God came true. It is a promise of the fulfillment of God's prophetic announcement. Now, it is finished also means it is the beginning of a new dawn, a beginning of a new season. It is interesting that our conventional thought that the meaning of this word is the end. It is finished. It is done. It's the end. But lo and behold, such word it is finished was actually the beginning of a new age, a new dawn, a new season, the season of God. It is finished is telling us that aside from the fulfillment of the prophecy long time ago, it is also important to consider that it means now it is the time of the reign of God's people. The time where God will always be with us through the Holy Spirit. It is the time when we as people and He as God will always be with us and we will be doing what God would like us and intend us to do. My friends, brothers and sisters, the atoning work of God the completion of God's atoning work was done. It is now time for us to consider and also think that since His atoning work was done, what will be next? When Jesus said, it is finished, the next is the beginning of something new. Yes, physically, at that time, Jesus said, and it means for his body, it is spirit. But for us, as his body, those of us who believe in the Lord, it is the beginning of a new thing. Remember this, my brothers and sisters. Whenever we are reading this word, or considering or thinking about this word, it is finished. Number one. It means God came true and God will always fulfill His promise. Secondly, God is inviting us. Since He has done the atoning work, He is inviting us the new season, the season of God. It is finished. God fulfilled His mission, His work. It is now our beginning the beginning of a new work. I hope you will always think about this because God would like us to engage with Him in the beginning of a new season, the season of God and the season of His people. Thank you very much. May the Lord bless you. Hello everyone, my name is Pastor Manny Selva Cruz. I'm the pastor of LA First Church of the Nazarene. And today we're going to talk about the last word, seventh word of Christ at the cross when he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. There are three important words that we could learn from this verse. First, relationship. Second, trust. And third is commitment. First, 
relationship. There is a relationship between God, Jesus, and God. He calls God as His Father. And Jesus is the only begotten Son of God. There is closeness, there is unity, there is love, there is harmony between the two. You see, we have relationship with our family members, the father, the wife, the children. That relationship is important. We need to build this relationship. But we need to build a relationship with God, which is more important. When you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you have a personal relationship with God. And then you could call God as your Heavenly Father. Because through Jesus, we have been adopted into His family. And second, because we are in the family, we learn how to trust one another. God trusts you, and you must learn to trust God completely. Without trust, there is no real relationship. To trust means to put your confidence on God, to put your belief on Him, to put your faith upon Him. And so the question that we need to ask ourselves is, do you trust Him completely? You see, Christ is trusting God, the Father, His future, the immortal part of Him, His soul and spirit. He knew that He is safe in the hands of the Father. When He said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit unto you, He uses the word commit. It means to pledge His soul, to face His death with full assurance of faith, to dedicate His future, to give totally everything to God, His Father. And this is what Jesus is teaching us in this moment as we meditate upon this seventh word. We must learn to commit our lives to Him totally, especially during this time of this global pandemic called the coronavirus. You see, many people are fearful, they're anxious, they're worried of their health, worried of their loved ones, worried about the economy. We are in deep danger every single day because of this invisible enemy that lurks everywhere we go. You see, we have no control of the virus. We have no control of the pandemic. And that is why we need to learn to trust Jesus, to trust God by committing our lives to Him, committing our faith, our health unto Him, committing our families' health to God, committing our future, our careers, our, the economy of our country to the Lord. We must learn to trust Him completely. When He said, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit you see, the more we commit to God, the more it builds strength. The more it builds relationship, the more it builds trust and confidence. Commitment shields us from the enemy's attack. Commitment to God assures us that our future is good. Have you committed your life to Christ? Now is the acceptable time. Behold, today is the day of salvation. May the Lord Jesus Christ bring life and encouragement. To our beings. Amen.